Good afternoon, everybody. A couple technical get difficulties getting started today, but I'm excited to uh, have our special guest, Chris, with us and excited to get things started today. Rachel, as always, it's great to see you. And it's Good great to see, to see all of you that have joined us today. Really excited to, uh, to have this conversation. Obviously, this was a big week for us over here over at the CIO Toolbox as We've released the CIS controls into our system and certainly looking to broaden our, our scope with our security and VCSO side of our, our uh, platform. And that's why I asked Chris to join us today. Chris uh, Johnson of Pinpoint Solutions has been a great resource to me throughout the process and in, in really learning about things. Chris, welcome. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, we are excited. And um, before we get started uh, on the conversation with myself and Chris, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is our July updates. And uh, Rachel, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but I'll, I'll help you through this because I know you and I didn't have a chance to catch up. But really, we got a few new things that came in here in July. Yes, yes. And uh, I also want to echo um, Brian and saying thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today. Um, taking an hour out of your life to come walk us through CIS. Um, it's wonderful timing. Um, it's almost like we planned it. Wow. Uh, because <laughs> we just released uh, CIS integrations into VCO Toolbox. Um, you can see on the screen there, uh, new assessments, updated Office 365, uh, Cybersphere Canada, ISO 27001. And we also did new account management tools. We're so excited about the new account rater. Um, we actually had a, a nice discussion about it in our Facebook group on Monday. If uh, I don't know how many I was of you are. waiting for the plug. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I put the plug in here. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, for those of you who aren't aware, we do have a Facebook group for community, uh, sorry, not community, account managers um, and MSP owners where we discuss account management, client relationships, how to make that better. Brian and I run it. We're in there all the time. We have a, a great community of people. Um, so we talked about that um, on Monday in our, in our Facebook Live in the group. Um, and yeah, anyway, lots of exciting stuff happening in VCO Toolbox this week. Yeah, we're really excited. You know, we've been asked to bring more account management tools in. So some of the things that we've done is, you know, beyond that account rate or just the ability to start tracking the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats mm -hmm. throughout your clients. Um, we're going to be having future cl classes on how to do and use the business canvas to really expand your reach within the client and understand how they tick. Our asset management updates include finally bringing in all the dynamic assets that all you guys customize in your PSA systems that, that uh, make things crazy. So you can now clone policies and make them really fit for your need. And then the final thing is by popular demand, we've added a Kanban board into the recommendations view. So really the ability to drag and drop things and, and get things moving. So again, for those of you that are already a BCIO Toolbox customer on this uh, call, we just wanted to make sure that you knew the latest updates. To get more on those updates, just uh, as you log into the system, right on the top toolbar, you'll see our message center. And inside the message center, you'll be able to click and get a link of everything with great detail. But that's enough about what we're doing. We're here to hear about what Chris can tell us about the CIS controls. So with that, I, I want to formally welcome you, Chris, and you know, kind of set the table a little bit and let people know a little bit about you. You know, you've been in the industry a long time, doing a lot around uh, you know security, not only as an MSP participant, but certainly out there in the traditional commercial enterprise space as well. And you know, as as your bio shows here, you've got a heavy involvement with the CompTIA community. You know, strong ties to that for a long time, and really your goal in life, and, and you know, not to put words in your mouth, but it's really to help security enable the MSPs of the world that are really looking to make the jump to an MSSP type arrangement or really broaden their security skills. Am I assessing that properly, Chris? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it uh, it boiled down to one thing, I think, for me, I was an MSP too. So I, as an MSP running my own company, I relied on, say, people like you to, to help me navigate both as an MSP from an operational and, and business growth standpoint. But then, you know, as I really got into growing my MSP, I found that, you know, differentiators are 
are really what sets us apart from our competitors. And when we do a good job, then we, we grow quickly and, and we get a following that kind of comes with that, both from our peers and that showing the evidence with our clients. And so for us, it was when we really started to focus on cybersecurity. So when I sold my company, uh, the, the premise for that was actually really tied to my involvement in healthcare, the HIPAA compliance component. So from there, you kind of continue to forward that along and things around HIPAA compliance started to evolve too. So which kind of leads us to, I think, the premise for today, which is CIS version eight and how did we get here? Yeah, no doubt. And, and I think that's a big part of what we want to bring forth to the community today is really you know, which risk framework's right for you? You know, while we're going to focus a lot on CIS today, there's certainly a lot of them that are out there. What's the intent of using these frameworks? And how can this framework potent these frameworks potentially guide you as you expand your services into security, while at the same time giving you some things to think about so you don't take on more than you are willing to do, either from a capability standpoint or from a risk standpoint? So we really want to make sure that we focus on, on those things today as well. And, uh, you know, really excited to jump into the conversation. As yeah, always, before guys, we get uh, before you. we get started, I just wanted to say, um, any, if you have any questions as we're going along, feel free to put them in the q and I've got my eyes on that. I'll be able to jump in, uh, interrupt if I need to, and uh, let these gentlemen know that you have questions. So. Awesome. Yeah. And we encourage that folks don't wait until just the end. We'll certainly have a Q and a session there, but if there's something pertinent that you want to jump into and dive deeper when we're in subject, you know, please jump in. Those of you that have worked with me before, you know, I adapt quickly. <laughs> so, you know, really what we wanted to today is first introduce the CIS controls and more importantly, version eight, which was just released this quarter for those that might not be aware of the, uh, you know, of, uh, the CIS controls or what they can bring to the table. And maybe, you know, let's start first, Chris, with a little bit of a discussion on the first point that shows up here. What can the CIS do to help you and your customer in solving problems? Well, it's, it's usually if you're having the conversation about CIS at all, it's probably because you already have problems. Uh, I think that it's a very, I think it's a two, twofold thing. We have all been dealt a hand that says either because you are in a regulated industry or your clients are, you now have to show compliance. And I think MSPs by and large would like to say that while compliance may not impact them, they would like to be able to say that they're running a business that has some focus on security, at least in protecting themselves from the threat actors that are out there. And then to be able to relay that sort of as a warm fuzzy to their clients and prospective clients. So for me, when I got involved in really digging into CIS, it's only because when I looked at the other frameworks, I thought, man, there's so many controls. This is so overwhelming. And at the end of the day, especially for smaller MSPs, where do I, where do I start? And if you look at the frameworks as a, as a holistic approach and just said, take the top 10 and we can all come up with five without trying, whether it's NIST 171 or CMMC or HIPAA, we can, we can list them off pretty quickly. The beauty in CIS and the way it's written is it says, do this first before you do step two. And by doing so, it's kind of its own roadmap for an MSP or anybody to start adopting a security best practices with it laid out for you, kind of like an instruction manual. And I think you've hit so, on one of the, the most important parts there, Chris, because you know I myself, as I looked at security frameworks back when I was running my data centers, it was difficult sometimes when you looked at some of these security frameworks to know what the next step was. You know, they were really helping you with the identification side of the process and the detect side of the process, but really weren't helping you as much. And certainly they've all matured a bit, but really getting to the remediation steps. And that's certainly something that I, I've seen to be a little bit easier to grasp in the world of CIS. Yeah, the other piece too is the contradictions that a lot of these frameworks have. So if you think about if you think about CIS specifically, it is heavy focus on technology, right? It is a, it's very much a, techni a technology framework as opposed to say HIPAA, which is a heavily focused on privacy and it even breaks it out, technology administration. And um, I just totally drew a blank, but oh, physical, administrative and, and tech, right? So three categories and not to say that the categories don't exist in all frameworks, but CIS is really, really focused on what's happening when you start talking about ones and zeros in an environment 
over the physical uh, who has physical access, say, to that room. And, and I think that also helps as an MSP because by and large, your clients are coming to you and they're not asking you, hey, uh, what do you think? Should I go with the, the uh, Schlage or I might even say that right? You know, what key tumbler should I get from Lowe's before <laughs> I put the door locks on my, in my office? And I think we've got to be uh, cognizant of that. But at the same time, our role in this is to secure the digital infrastructure. And it's probably the most difficult piece of the equation when you consider it's not one door into the office, right? It's uh, doors we haven't even thought about yet. Well, I say it all the time. The only way you can truly lock everybody out is, you know, unplug it from the wall, take it off the internet and turn off the lights, right? You know, there's always some way to access that data otherwise. And certainly we want to make sure we're mitigating that risk as much as possible. So I think, you know, we've touched upon that a little bit, but really what we're trying to figure out is not just the, the why of why we need to do this, but then understanding what those risks are that we want to secure. So Chris, maybe we can dig a little bit more deep into this and kind of understand, you know, what are, you know, as we're looking at risk, what are some considerations that a, a you know, a customer should be taking and by proxy the MSP considering as they guide their customer? Well, I think in this case, it's two questions and, and you have to look at it through um, the two lenses that this covers. So one is me, the consumer, or me, the, um, the, the personal life, right? What's important to me as, a, as an individual outside of work, because it very much has an impact on what I do as an employee in work, right? So I think about things like, um, it doesn't matter to me what passwords I use at work, because I don't use those passwords for, say, my banking or for when I go shopping on, at bestbuy.com. The problem is when you when you go deeper with that and ask some really um, deeper questions with the end users is you'll find pretty quickly that while the passwords may not be the same, the the criteria or the formula used to create the password is actually exactly the same. Uh, so maybe I don't use my pet's name in both places, um, but maybe I do, or or I have some weird idea of how I keep them separate. But then you ask the question after that, and this is kind of the follow up. Do you do work from your personal devices? Do you do personal stuff from your work devices? And then you realize it doesn't matter. It's all blurred together. So then that gets into when you're talking to the organization or even self-reflecting, what's important in this case to the business? And I think there's uh, any business that's really focused on growth and, and having that work culture that, that says that we, we are about our staff gets into, well, what's important to the people that work here? Beyond, beyond what's important to the business to grow the intellectual property, what's important because you're, you're seeing this happen every day, you know, the uh, workman's comp claims or unemployment claims that are complete fraudulent claims. And it's like, those are impacting real people, whether it's impacting the business or not. And then the flip side of that is when a ransomware happens at work, as an employee of that organization, we have two things in our minds. I'm not saying anything because they're going to blame it on me. Or if it was me, you know, then I'm going to get fired or who, who, it didn't impact me personally. So why is it a big deal? And why should I care? And the reality is because it's impacting all of us. And collectively, if we look at the colonial pipeline uh, and, the, and the meat shortages, that suddenly took it to a personal level. So I hope that with that event taking place, that we're now not looking at this through the lens of work and personal life. We're just looking at it through the lens of if I want to be secure, we have to be secure. But so you, you definitely hit upon something that's important to really think about is it's not just risk to your business, but it's risk to the people that are a part of your business. And if each one of us, you know, when we're going through security awareness training or just educating our teams, really look at it that way and say, remember, not only are we holding our customers' information or, or whoever's information in here, but we have your information in here too, right? Our HR systems are populated as such. So, you know, the risk is not just a corporate risk when we're working within our environments, but if each individual really kind of thinks to themselves about personal responsibility, you're entrust, your own data is in there and you want to entrust the safety as for your friends and family that you have working at these environments with you. So, so selling point, let me just throw this out there. As a selling point, not because we want to be selling this, but if you ask the question to a business that's say in the construction space, what do you think that they're going to say back to you as far as what's important? Maybe the project, project schedules, there might be some, there, it's not like it's full of intellectual property, right? It's not like there's some like magic formula for how to do right. curb and gutter or how to read uh, drawing, electrical drawings. 
but every single person that's participating feasibly has first name, last name, email address, phone number. None of this is about the business anymore. It's about every single individual. And I think when that conversation happens, it's like, well, hey, you know, Mr. Whoever or, or Mrs. Whoever, whatever the name and company, like, hey, what happens when your kid can't go to soccer camp because he's on the no fly list because of something that you did little, if anything, to protect at the office for, for, you know, securing your business. No doubt. And, um, you know, these are all considerations that we have to think about and really, you know, get in tune with as a community, not just as a tech community. Right. So, but uh, let's kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the challenges facing the MSP today. You know, I know that, um, you know, when I'm looking at what's going out there in the in, in the macro environment today, it's amazing to me how we're really seeing legislation and also, you know, damages coming to the MSP level in a way that was really never experienced even as recent as four or five years ago. You know, it, it, it's... Um, it's an interesting time out there as you know, the proliferation of ransomware keeps going on. Obviously, most of you that are on this call with us today experience the Kaseya event in some way, shape or form, and certainly not looking to throw any daggers necessarily there, but it's more the reality of, wow, one system got attacked and look at the downstream impact that can come from that type of attack. So, you know, Chris, the things that I've been really following is the legislation, some of it happening at the state level, some of it yeah. having overall, that's really looking at ways to kind of control how let litigation is going to be conducted as an example during this process. And then I think we're all aware of, because all of us have to, to adhere to this as well, you know, some of the challenges in obtaining cyber insurance. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on those. Uh, well, as soon as you say insurance, I start to get all kind of itchy and yeah. uh, I start <laughs> no breaking doubt. out in hives. Um, so there are a couple of things that I think are really important for us to, to talk about when it comes to cyber insurance is that uh, it's whose truth are we working with when we answer these questionnaires? I think there's a, there's a big problem with questions that are yes, no, almost yes, no radio buttons, right? And then but that doesn't actually answer the question because the no is obviously you're not getting coverage. And yes is a lie because there's no humanly possible way to address the question being asked because the technology might not even exist yet. Uh, the other piece of this is cyber insurance by and large isn't ready for what's coming as far as paying out claims. And so that if there were to be a large volume of claims submitted all at the same time, there's a good chance we'd be in another sort of... Uh, disaster, if you will, with the government having to step in and help because there's no way these insurance companies could pay all the claims if, if what we see trending right now were to actually happen on a larger scale. And, and you're spot on in that. You know, obviously the biggest threat to the cyber or to the insurance company, certainly not to defend them, is these claims can get very, very expensive, very, very quickly, right? Because of the downstream impact we just talked about. And I know as an example here in the state of Connecticut, and I, I know similar legislation exists in Ohio and in Utah, they're starting to look at ways to minimize some of the impact all around. So sys controls are now a very big important part of most yeah. Connecticut companies' business. If you can demonstrate that you're adhering to sys controls, invoking them and putting them into place, you will not be held punitively should you have a breach event. Well, that's a win for the business. That goes mm -hmm. without saying. It's also a win for the insurance company because now they can start calculating and underwriting to more predictable claim sets, right? You're really talking about the cost of the ransomware and remediation potentially as opposed to the downstream impact and all the different individual cases that have to be litigated from there. Agree? I, yeah, totally. I mean, it's it's no different than uh, you know other other areas where you know if you were in a car accident and you were you were not found liable for say it being your fault, that doesn't mean it it avoids you of say potential civil suits, right? This is kind of in that same vein, but addressing it from the yes, it's too bad that your data was compromised, but we followed all the protocols. So for you to blame us for what happened to you 
we're not going to let you do that. And I think, I think Ohio is another state that's adopted that, that you, I think there's three, right? Oh, today. It's Ohio, Utah, and Connecticut have formally adopt those, but there's similar legislation starting to pop up. We're going to see it across US. the country. Yeah. I think one of the things I think we're going to see is we're going to have to do this quickly as states are also doing the opposite side of this too, right? They're doing the whole cons- CCPA for the consumer in California, you know, GDPR being copycatted in multiple states. If if we don't get these act, you know, out there quickly, you know, we're going to have this weird battle happening when anything happens. And so that obviously doesn't help the insurance providers either. Yeah. So before we move on to some other subjects, you know, one of the things that we'll be definitely talking about is who owns the responsibility. And one of the things I want you, all the MSPs that are on the call today to keep in mind is really when we're supporting our customers, who truly owns that responsibility, right? What is born on the customer? What is born on the MSP to maintain? And how do we make sure those lines aren't fuzzy as we move through that process? But Chris, I know that one of the things that we wanted to talk about before we head into the CIS is kind of the evolution of NIST as a framework. And before we get started there, I just want to bring up a a comment that uh, Wayne Maw put into chat. Wayne, thanks for joining us today. And he really talks about the beauty of the frameworks as a concept, right? Mm -hmm. While we have these different frameworks, they're meant to crosswalk together. There's integration between each one of them. Matter of fact, one of the things that we're setting on the journey here at BCIO Toolbox in Q3 and Q4 is doing those crosswalks and locking down those compliance statements so we can manage that for you better on your behalf as well. And when we look at this, though, it really was born out of really the evolution of the NIST process. And then from that, you know, as you can see on the left hand side, a number of different other frameworks were spawned. So maybe you can share with us a little bit for those that that haven't watched that close up like you have, what that evolution has looked like. Uh, The evolution has been painful. (laughs) Um, I I look back, so I'll just go back. This will age me a little bit. But when I first started getting into compliance and controls um, was in the early 2000s when the privacy rule for HIPAA just became brought into law. So like right around 2003, 2004, when it was now being, quote, enforced. And you would have things that are in this regulatory requirement that would say things like uh, if you send PHI or sorry, uh, yeah, patient health information, not EPHI, this was the privacy rule. So if you sent a fax, analog fax, not digital, to a destination, that fax machine had to live inside a room that had a locked door. And I remember going through this and having the argument, well, what happens if I accidentally dial that 1-800 number for mattress discounters, that's the, you know, blast that goes out to a thousand people? How do you, how do you compensate for that? Well, back then it was all about just follow the rules and don't try to argue the why are you doing it? The omnibus rule was not until 2013. So full 10 years later, before they really started addressing, well, you might be using a fax machine when you put it on the fax machine, but it's ending up in someone's email folder and now it's digital anyways. So you had this by and large NIST frameworks that were all sort of based on NIST. And the problem was they weren't keeping up with what was happening in the technology space. So if you look at CIS, um, that's probably the best example of seeing real and fast change happening to help keep us sort of current with addressing these control sets. So uh, NIST 800-171, NIST 853, by and large, were focused on the, the federal government space But all of these really had the same intent, right? This is all about protecting information. And depending on which framework you pick, it's what type of information were they focused on. So obviously healthcare was PHI or EPHI. You know, you got PCI for credit card data. You got uh, NIST uh, 800-171 for like uh, controlled unclassified information. The list just goes on and on and on. CIS is like, hey, information is information. And if it's got privacy and involves you and I, then we need to protect that data, right? So I think this is where we started to see real focus on it's not so much about what kind of data it is, it's is it sensitive information Mm -hmm. that potentially exploits or undermines somebody else. And so that's where we are today. So CIS, if you look at it at its core, it's pointing to NIST. It's pointing to these other frameworks very easily and quite honestly at a very high level because CIS isn't saying we're the end-all be-all for how granular you need to get. But 
what needs to be done. And it goes back to the beginning again with the whole CIA model. If you're not familiar with it, confidentiality, integrity, and accessibility, all frameworks have that at the core. So regardless of who your client is, regardless of what framework you're adopting, if you use that for each of these controls, then it's not so complicated anymore. It's whether or not reasonably you can do it. And, and really, you know, what you're talking about here is what the reality of picking these frameworks are. Sometimes they don't just stand alone. And I think that's a little bit about what Wayne was sharing with us in the comment as well. You know, really, you got to think about intent and think about use case. It's not uncommon today to really see a general risk framework being used at the top level and then applying your compliance regulation if you're HIPAA based, if you're Sarbanes Oxley, right. if, if you're Fed Ramp, you're right, to really round that around. So, you know, I know one of the things that we really wanted to focus on as we start talking about how do we approach our client with a security sure. offering was, you know, think about the intent of this and what is the goal of this. I, Chris, I think, Chris, you'd agree, you know, we, we need to understand what the customer really needs to accomplish on this. Are they doing sure. this internally for best practices? Are they doing this strictly for a cyber liability requirement that they might have out there? Do they need to be fully compliant at what level to bid and then win jobs, right? So, you know, you know, I think intent is a very important concept for us to really have a conversation with our clients because we can over-architect almost anything if we want to, right? So we, we right. Need to really understand what they need. Well, an intent leads to capability, right? So if we know what the intent is, then we ask the question, okay, from a capability standpoint, what's realistic about us being able to complete or address at any level? And I think that's the other beauty of CIS is like, it's like, hey, you can be an implement, implementation, you know, group one, uh, and maybe someday you'll be group two or three. But what I hate is when someone tells me, I'll never be able to do that. We don't have the resources to do that. And it's like, well, if you look at group one, and this is where I get, I get a little bit up on the pedestal with, with MSPs, name an MSP that's not running an RMM tool that does, you know, inventory of the assets that they're managing. Yep. Hey, look, you just did control one. Look, you didn't even have to try. And I think that's a that's a great you know thing to bring up too. It's kind of that translation and, and then defining your risk, right? What are the things you're doing that you just haven't really established and put into a control set? Certainly a framework will help you get started there. And it's the first step in assessing, you know, where am I today and where is my risk definition as I move forward, right? Yeah. And we talk about assessing your risk tolerance and we'll speak more to that momentarily, but really it's about defining where your risk points are right up front so you can even worry about what your tolerance is and where you should rate yourself later. Well, and I think it's asking this one really loaded question. Are you, are you not doing it because you believe that you can't make it go away? Or is it, you know, some other reason? So we use this term a lot. I've installed XYZ security product to eliminate this risk. And the reality is, if I look at products that we implement, my goal really is, is to reduce. And the question that I have to ask, is this going to reduce it enough to justify the cost? Which is that formula for going back to defining your risk? Because the reality is, it's not about the... Uh, the remove of risk, it's about the reduction of risk. Yep. And, you know, one of the things that we have to do here, and it's kind of our third point is what's required internally to support these risks that we identify. You just spoke about the RMM tool as an example, right? There are systems and services, and I know, you know, when, that MSPs are always talking about their stack, but I think we need to understand what are the eternal measurement requirements that we actually have and how do we then translate that into the automation we hope to implement so we can re record this. And if you can't automate it, admit it. Yeah. There's certain things you'll never be able to automate yep. in these assessments. You know, I mean, we'd love to automate everything that we do within our platform. It's physically impossible because you can't assess a, pro a process that way, right? Or a procedure. Well, that's every single client and client prospect we talk to. Well, so like, just tell me what you guys are going to do and I'll sign off on it. And then I don't have to deal with it. If you get that client, I'll tell you right now, I feel like that's the one I want to run away from as fast as I can because they also shop staples based on the advertisement, right? Yep, no doubt. So Rachel, I think we got some other chats coming in, correct? Yeah, we were just, um, Ryan points out that risk rejection is not an option and that these are the days to acknowledge that for sure. Well, and no. I know Brian, we've talked about this a lot. But, oh, you know, no you, doubt. <laughs> you know, it's when funny. When you've got that client that just doesn't want to admit that uh, that their risk is as high as it is and then working with them to, to help them understand the 
why it's so necessary yeah, to put I mean, these, these things in place. It's simply put, right, you know, what, when we're defining our risk, we really have to understand, you know, that we have to be as risk averse as possible because we're going to be held to that standard more and more with the cyber liability and other things with us. So, you know, and, and we can use risk tolerance as a measure for when customers say no too, right? Yeah. The M normal MSP move is when, when I hear no to a security project, right? I, I fall into the, well, you, you're now open to uh, a ransomware attack or you're now open to more you know, malicious software coming in. And that's true, but it's a fear, uncertainty and doubt approach, right? We're trying to tell the customer what might happen, not what if happened. You know, I say it all the time when you look at some of the memes out there, budget before a security event and you'll see three quarters in a bucket and then you know, money after or budget after a security event, there's a bucket full of 50s, right? Yeah. The reality is, you know, we've got to educate our customers that you can't reject risk anymore. If you say you're a five on a risk tolerance scale of one to five and that's totally risk averse, then you say no to a security project. We got to educate them to now you're opening up more risk. You need to downgrade yourself and maybe having a discussion that's really pertinent to them instead of the what if scenario will help them start understanding why they need to intersect these products into the mix. Chris, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as well. I, I would just add that I think we're at a point where we need to be clear in articulating to the clients, the cost calculator. Mm -hmm. So if I think about it, we've had arguments over this over the years, you know, if my budget for it is X percentage. If you look at the cybersecurity percentage on average, uh, a business that's really focused on it might be spending somewhere between three and 4% on average. 10% um, is what's recommended. I would say if you can get a customer in that five to 7%, it's probably the sweet spot. But here's the thing, pre-breach, it's in that one to two, maybe 3%, if they're even recognizing it. It's, it's not just going from the three quarters in a bucket to $50 bills. It's a forever increase plus the bucket being full of 50s. So I, I believe if you can get a client to recognize ahead of an event, because events are going to happen, you can potentially reduce that spend on the monthly and annual volume by probably 50% of what it would be when a breach occurs. Because now insurance gets involved. Now all these other players are going to say, hey, if we're going to still be in a relationship, my involvement has got a cost of X, whereas before, because I didn't have to worry about you, I never had to add an additional cost to our relationship. And let's face it, when, when the incident strikes, everybody is going to be looking to see who else can pay, right? It's and everybody's billing. Yep. Everybody's billing when something happens. Oh, no doubt. We had uh, Michael Crean from Solutions Granted on the podcast, the MSP Business School podcast a few weeks ago. And he was talking about how one of his mentors would uh, have a piece of paper ready for the client. If the client said no, then they, he would say, all right, then this is how much it's going to cost you when that bad day happens for me to come in and fix it. <laughs> and then just say, balls in your court. <laughs> Yeah, and, and if you can show the cost of remediation, that's going to resonate at least with some percentage of the people you, you deal with because it can be a number larger than they ever want to accept. Well, the, the cost on average with like a forensics company, it's kind of like attorneys. You know, you want an attorney on retainer, right? Because in case you need them, you don't have to wait for the one that's available because usually the one that's available probably isn't the one you want. So you get the retainer in place, right? Well, forensics investigators are the same thing. So you could prepay, but they don't give you a like, hey, this is an unlimited bucket of hours to do the forensics on your environment to determine what happened. And so if you're not prepaying to get some of that in there, then it's like, yep, we're billing you around the clock until we solve the problem or you run out of money. It's like the uh, the scene in Silicon Valley where you know the lawyer was looking at, uh, at them saying, no, the retainer just gives you the right to retain them. Then when something happens, you have to start, they have to start billing them. So I just paid just to have them up. Or take my phone call? Yeah. You pay them for the business <laughs> card, right? That has my cell phone number on it with a fee of $5,000 a month or $5,000 one time. Doesn't matter. But here's my business card. Yeah. So in the spirit of keeping us on time a little bit, I kind of want to push a little bit to third-party vendors as well. Yeah. You know, one, of, one of the things I think we really need to take in consideration, and I'm even seeing more in the forums, is you know the, the suppliers that you work with, 
need to be able to produce and show that they are also adhering to these standards as well. So you've got to really think about your third party vendors and, and go deep on them and say, who owns what data in my yeah. world? What information have I shared with them? That again, it can go back to what we were saying earlier, just be personally identifiable information that we want to protect for, for our own companies as good stewards, right? Who are those folks having that? And how do we make sure that we've got the right uh, controls in place to manage that? that relationship as well. Yeah, that's the the who owns the data, where is the data, and how do I get the data moved or get the data back when I need it? I don't think those questions are asked asked nearly enough. Yeah. And so, you know, we'll we'll probably have a breakout session in the future just about third party risk, but I, you know, it's something that we need to start considering a little bit more and more cuz your insurance companies are so let's talk a little bit about how an MSP can now build a go-to-market program, right? Everybody wants to add that next S into their, their cycle. You see that, you know, everybody's obviously looking at security and their security stacks. But we're really going to talk about how an MSP should evaluate going to market and are they really ready to go to market? And if not, how can they get there? So the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is what you should have in your stack, right, Chris? You know, we, we talked a little bit about this yesterday in our pre-conversation, just about we love products as an right. industry. We love products, and we love cool GUI interfaces, and we love all kinds of cool stuff. But really, when we're evaluating our stack, we got to think about what we need to produce as a, in the outcome, right? So these controls that we're talking about, specifically the CIS controls, can really help guide you to what your stack should be. Yeah, um, I think that the problem with the stack isn't what you should have in the stack, it's what is in it and what should be in it. So we talked about this before, mm -hmm. I had it said to me, it's kind of like reconciling a checkbook. If you, if you have $100 go in and when you reconcile the checkbook, you come out with 110 went out, is that, was that what you expected? You know, did you spend more than you took in? I think the same idea is in your in your tech stack. When you go look in the system tray and you're like, whoa, why are there two RMM agents running on this computer? Am, am I being let go? Is this leftover from somebody else? Did no one ever look at this machine? So I think the what you should have in your stack is really important and it ties to what you said about the outcome. So I think we, we too often go into an environment and it's like we push all of the stuff that we believe is part of our stack. And sometimes we end up pushing things or not recognizing things that are there that shouldn't be. Yep. And I, I think that's a great, you know, story to tell there, you know, it's evaluating what shouldn't be as much as what should be. And when you're thinking about, you know, what should be in your stack, look at those controls and say, what are the, what are the things that we need and don't need? to be in the stack to really achieve. If I'm only at CIS controls implementation group one, and that's what I'm going to be held to, maybe I don't need an outsource SOC program, right? You know, and, and we've got to be conscious of, of that as well. So. Uh, well, in you know, supporting, in supporting this go to market model, I think about you saying control one made me really think about this from a financial standpoint, it's one thing to talk about costs, right? Like the, yeah. the agent, all these other things. But if I think about if I've got 10 assets in inventory with client Acme company and I'm billing them for seven users and they have 10, I am I'm leaving money on the table from a pure sales perspective, right? But the flip side of that is now when we talk about insurance and liability and security, I have three assets I don't know about. I don't know if they have my stuff on it. I don't know if they're properly configured. I don't know who they are. They might not even be assets that should be in that environment. Uh, there's there's a lot to consider as you move through this. And, and I think, you know, another thing we have to consider is what's the industry that the customer resides in, right? You know, is it the same for, you know, while there's standards and frameworks, there's a reason why there's different compliance uh, around HIPAA versus ISO versus sure. FedRAMP versus, you know, the, the NIST protocols for DOD. So, you know, I think we have to take into consideration where do those customers live? What are the requirements there? And then try to match, you know, up from there. And it seems pretty obvious, but we love standardization as a community, right? right. So we're, we're building a sync. We're trying to build a single stack and morph our customers to it. Yet there might be nuance pieces that we're overlooking in that process. I think it's pretty limited though. And, and when I say limited, I think about um, if you're working in like a, a, 
a DFARS or ITAR, you know, more federal, potentially controlled, unclassified, but maybe even getting into more of the sensitive information. That's a pretty specific requirement for things that should be in your stack, things that you have to do differently. You walk back and look at any other vertical. Now it's like maybe more of, is it stored in the United States? Uh, what are you doing to lock it down to meet things like maybe Fed ramp requirements, mm -hmm. but it's not as restrictive. So walking back to kind of what I think it was Wayne said this, like looking at the frameworks from a, an intent, if you were following CIS as an MSP right now today, and you suddenly on board for the first time ever, most of you probably have at least one that's in this category, say a HIPAA compliant, a client bound by HIPAA compliance, you shouldn't have this huge mountain to climb to be able to prove to that client that you can meet those requirements because of what you've done with CIS. Now, I realize they're not exactly the same, but if you look at it closely enough, you'll go, oh, I can see how this crosswalks and maps to what they need to do. I just have to make some changes in the language to show how we're doing it in the language that they understand. Well, you know, and I think that's probably good news to most of us out here from an MSP position. It really does say, standardization, this isn't going to cause us to be ha have to start looking at unstandardized and having different ways of, of supporting across groups. It really means if we use these controls appropriately, we can kind of form that plan and then just have to learn the language, as you said. I think yeah, the I was biggest... going to say, it's... oh, sorry, I was no, going to say it ahead, sounds Rachel. more like a, a, like a translating yeah. rather than a revamping. <laughs> right. Or there's an additional control for a certain framework that doesn't exist in another one for, for various reasons. And obviously you might know that because of the industry where I get more concerned at this point, and this, and this is from the 10 years of, of progress with, with frameworks and, and states starting to recognize that they need to participate, kind of like the CIS being adopted in three states, is what are the responses when an incident occurs based on where your client resides? So like, for example, some states have a, you know, if there's an incident or an event that might've been a compromise of a machine or, or user data, you might only have five days to respond as opposed to 30 days to respond. So to me, that's almost paramount as you think about your risk and clients that you're onboarding is like, what are my obligations in the event that something bad does happen based on where my client lives, not necessarily tied to the industry that they're in. Yep, and you've really hit into the third point that we needs to be considered here is, you know, when you're doing the level of responsibility, especially when this is a shared responsibility in most cases, you really have to get very black and white and probably critical of where those lines are. So if an event were to happen, everybody's kind of on the same page on where the liability, well, not even the liability, but where the responsibility to remediate and, sure. and who owns the problems even help those investigators that have to come in and play. I think there's one question that I have found myself asking over and over again. A business that has four walls and an IT guy that works there has all the obligations tied to the people that are part of that entity. But when they don't have that IT guy or they outsource to an MSP, the MSP now has net new uh, department. It's like an MSP is in a skyscraper that has say a hundred floors and on each floor is one of your clients. It's you're still the same IT department for all of those floors. So we don't get to be as uh, indemnif indemnifying to a client that says, I'm not taking that on because all of a sudden they just took, uh, they just added to you risk on 99 of those hundred floors. Yep. And I, and I think that's a big thing to consider is, you know, how does this you know, risk compound as you move through it? And, you know, does the rift risk really shift to you 100%? And, and I, you know, my simple statement is in most cases, it does not. So people need to know, and I'm talking from the customer seat here, you know, when they take you on as an MSP or an MSSP, they haven't just absolved themselves 100% of that responsibility either. But we have, we have done a good job of giving them that sense, right? We've yeah. given them that sense of, hey, sign here. And it's all you can eat and all the IT that you need. And your printer will always print when you hit print. Uh, and, I, and I say that because that's why we were in this business in the first place, right? Take security away. We didn't get into providing managed services because our goal was, I'm going to prevent ransomware from happening to you. <laughs> no, we got in this business because either we were in a business model before where we were like, we could do this better than the place I'm at now. And we can provide a sense of satisfaction to our clients that says, hey, this guy makes me more productive, more efficient, lowers my overhead, all of those things. 
Well, now you got all these security layers to factor in and it totally changes the dynamic, but the clients haven't been given that sense like, hey, this is more than just about how well you run the well-oiled machine. Now it's about how do we get secure and how do we share the responsibility of being secure together? So, you know, with that, I think that dovetails into our final topic we wanted to talk a little bit about today, which is the considerations an MSP needs to take as they start looking to evolve into this new go-to-market program. You know, and I think one of the first things you have to do in, in is be honest with yourself, do a self-assessment of the skills that you have. And, you know, this isn't, hey, you know, Chris has got pretty good security skills. I think he can handle being the secure lead guy. Let's promote him to that and then start selling it as if he's been in that seat for a hundred years, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we have to look into our own skill sets and say, what risk are we willing to take on by saying that we have skills that we might not yet possess or we need to hire up for or find another solution for? You got any thoughts on that, Chris, you know, in terms of team composition and how to get there? Yeah. And this is the kind of the, this is the tough conversation to have. So, cause I think it's not like you, you said, feasibly Chris could do it, but Chris is one person, right? Yeah. So I think back to when, when I had my MSP and we had, I think in our stack, I think we had like four different vendors for firewalls yeah. and we were looking at that going, okay, I got one engineer certified on two of them. I got another engineer certified on one of the others. You know, I've invested a lot of money in getting guys the skill sets that they need to manage these firewalls. And it's like, wow, I could have had one guy certified on one firewall and we only did one firewall vendor. You know, what's the overhead there? And then and then not just about the device or the vendor whose product we're using, but what does it really take to provide that management of firewalls for our clients? Because traditionally managed services is about selling a stack that for the most part involves a lot of automation, right? Windows patching, you know, drivers being pushed, the ability for them to get to the internet securely and some other things. We really aren't sitting at the end user's desk to go, oh, don't click on that. Nope, don't click on that. Oh, I saw a log file from your computer. You must have downloaded, you clicked on a link, you know, you're not there. And how much of FTE are we adding to the mix when we onboard, not just whether or not I have qualified resources if we were to take something on. So I think that's where you go to that next piece, which is being honest with yourself to say, hey, we're really good at these things. We want to add a sock or we want to implement a new SIM tool. Okay, well, is it in your best interest to add that internally or is that something that you're outsourcing and being honest with your clients to say, hey, we don't have the capability internally to do this, but we've taken on a partnership with a vendor or a company that does. We've got a new partner and we're going to deliver as if we were a larger company on a larger scale. Uh, we no longer have to be afraid of the competitor stealing the business because we've partnered with you know, someone who specializes in that because they're partnering with the same company. And I think what you, you've really hit here is kind of how this, you need to have just a pure mentality shift if you're going to become, you know, play the, the more security game. Because to your point about, you know, what was the classic MSP like, those of us that have been around it as long as you and I know that really when we got into this, it was about operations, not security. Security was something that we had to take into consideration, but really we were trying to streamline operations, service, inability. And of course, it was also when some of the technology was a little bit more I needed a little bit more babysitting before some of the evolution of technology. Now we've got the flip side of the equation. We need to have security there, but you've got to really be honest with yourself and say, is it in my best interest to try to build or buy? I talked to a lot of MSP owners that said if they were going to start again today, they wouldn't build, they would buy, i.e. level one help desk, i.e. Sure. certain other skill sets. I think the opportunity that's on the table here, if you're thinking about going to market and what an MSP should consider here is there are best of breed yeah. certified tools out there and they have no ambition of taking your customer as you said because all they want to do is focus on the msps being the customer because their value you prop and where their revenue is derived and their profitability stays is if they don't have to talk at the customer level the msp becomes the intermediary to yeah. do that job for them right and now they can retain the profitability they need to reinvest into building a team that you would never be able to build as a single form msp right you know you're not going to be able to go build a 50 person sock with five Five levels of, of security oh, inside no. the 24 seven. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, just, it, it's unfeasible. So this is what I would say. And I think this sums it up. 
if I think about being an MSP, I think about the evolution, right? So I remember when there wasn't really an MSP, you did break fix because that's the model. And the tools that were there supported that model. MSP kind of followed the tools supporting that ability to be an MSP. And then our media got involved and we started seeing the culture shift is to become an MSSP. If you look closely at what an MSSP is, it is a far cry from where an MSP is. And they really are not sharing a lot of similarities other than maybe their billing model, right? So I've coined this phrase or coined this term, it's MS lowercase SP, because I think the evolution is MSPs have to sell security services or provide security services to stay in business. That doesn't mean you need to evolve and become something that you're not. Yeah. No, that's I know, great. Brian, you talked about how whenever you were running an MSP that you were looking at getting certified, I forgot what it was, but you said that the you noticed, you recognized that the cost to get all of your people oh, certified for those of us would have had to sell so much in order to make it up for it. So there, I see a lot of folks on the call that are contemporaries of mine. And uh, just remember when we all wanted to be Cisco gold guys and you would only have to add $3 million worth of, uh, or no, what was it? $1.8 million worth of Revenue, salary yeah. in order to get gold. So realistically, you only had to sell what about $3 million worth of, or 4 million or 5 million, whatever the number was of Cisco, just to break even on your salary, right? To, to keep gold. So you gotta be realist about what you can do. And, and we're getting a little short on time. So I want to yep. hit a couple quick points and make sure everybody knows how to get to you, Chris, and leave some time for Q&A as well. So, you know, the, the other thing I think you really need to consider and be, be sincere about is, do you have a strong incident response plan process? Most of us as MSPs have the tools to detect and recognize, but we might not have hardened our formal response plan or really know how to respond to more security event because that includes a communication plan that might include third party outsiders, litigators and public officials that never existed really at the operational level of the MSP. Considering our roles and responsibilities with our clients, I would argue that the incident response plan is almost more important at the client level than it even is at the MSP level, because yeah. who are they calling first? But we have to educate them, right? Because right. no, 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 I, that up front, so. I, I think that it comes from the MSP to get it there. But I think that do you have a strong incident response plan is, is so much bigger than being the MSP with one. It's does it include your client knowing what it is? And are they do they have one in place that has you at the top of that list? And obviously, it's better if you engage early, as we saw, you know, with the Kaseya incident. Yeah. The FBI and the in CIS were part of it, and the reason they were part of it is because this was an event that had potential national ramifications, yeah. right? So, and with the FBI, because it had global ramifications with the reach that the system had. So, yeah, you realize that you've got to be thinking a much broader sense than just your own territory and the people you got to notify internally in that. Right. And then the final thing that I really wanted to touch upon before we get into the the, the Q and A is. Do you even operate a formal governance process for your own MSP, right? Do, you know, forget about security for a moment, but do you have a way to really make sure that everything that you're saying that you're doing, you're actually doing and you can prove that out and manage to it? You know, I say this in almost every demo that, uh, that I have with a customer, you know, part of what we're reviewing in the IT review is not just to find findings that are going to create gaps so we can build a technology roadmap. We're finding these findings to make sure we're actually doing what we say we're doing in our contracts so that doesn't become a point of exposure at a later date. So, you know, my, my two cents verify. in the soapbox is if you guys don't have a formal governance process out there, think about it. For those of you that are on the security side of our platform with the VC sub module, COVID version five is right in there. While that speaks more to security, it can help you with a general guideline, even for just operational day-to-day -day governance as well. Chris, you got any thoughts on that before? Uh, you know, it's funny you said, yeah, it's funny you said COVID. I believe that that is one thing that all MSPs should have some level of impl implementation, at least for change management. I think that and security go hand in hand. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just start thinking about that, folks, that that will definitely be a session that with, you know, whether we have, Chris gets to join us again with it, we're definitely going to be looking at the governance process here at VCIO Toolbox and, and helping you get the education you need there. So with that said, you know, let's, let's talk before we go into Q&A, you know, how can, how can you be reached, Chris? Uh, well, I guess you just put all of the ways that I can be reached pretty much <laughs> on the sure slide there. You got it, got it, got it covered. <laughs> um, I would say those are probably the best is to shoot me an email or, or message me on LinkedIn. 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to field questions. Um, the questions I get the most often are, hey, I'm dealing with a specific control. I just need someone to help me navigate it a little bit because I'm getting pushed back from the client. And, and that, that I love giving answers back for that. If I can help in any way, you know, I remember being an MSP and the MSP community always was there for me. So if I can give back in any way, that's what I'm here for. And, you know, certainly I suggest if you, if you're looking for a listen to, um, you know, visit Chris's podcast, you know, it, it's, it's a great uh, informational source, certainly more security specific than like our MSP business school, where we talk more about the operational and, and business growth side of things. It'll really help you out there. So, um, you know, certainly yep. check that out. And then they are the, the raw conversations is how it was phrased to me. That's what we do. It is not rehearsed. It is there because someone has asked me a question. And I'm like, you know what? We're going to talk about this. Let's record. Beautiful. Do, so, do I sense a crossover episode happening? Yeah, yeah, I, think, yeah, I think Chris will be joining us on sure. MSP Business School. <laughs> I would say that's a safe bet in the fall time frame. And I think the real key, you know, I think we've even found our topic. Maybe, Chris, we, we talk about the governance concept there. You sure. know, I think that's a good one for us to take on. With that said, I want to thank everybody for joining us today and now open up the floor in the five or so minutes we have remaining to see if anybody's got any questions or thoughts that they want to come in and, um, you know, we'll certainly get those answered for you. Yeah, and if you uh, click the raise hand button, then we can invite you up here to talk with us with video if you're up for it. Oh, Rachel, you're making this really cool now. Yeah, no, I do what I can. <laughs> you know, I, I'm Brian, you were on uh, MSP 1337 a few weeks back. It's actually been, I think, a couple months back. Well, I know I sponsored it for a bit. I don't, I've not, you did. Had, the, I've not had the opportunity to actually chat on there. Though, I, I, the, I digress <laughs> then because uh, I have not had you on that. We need to do that as well. Yeah. I, I find that most of the vendors that I've had on the show have been tied to something that someone has either posted on LinkedIn and has tripped my trigger. And I'm like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta get answers yeah. from that. Uh, I'll give you the best example. I did one with, uh, I had a question get posted. Who, who does an evaluation on the people that works? You know, what are the risks that people have in the organization that you have as a client? So I reached out and I, I, I responded to the survey and we got on a call and you wouldn't believe the number of holes that are in people reviews for background checks and that kind of thing. And these are the people that are working for the organizations that we've onboarded as clients. How well do you know the people that work there? And it was a great conversation. I interviewed the uh, CEO and founder of Common Controls Hub. And that's how this kind of stuff starts. I mean, that's actually how I found VCIO Toolbox for myself was through a, a comment that Brian had put on LinkedIn. See, got to get out there, and mix it up, guys. There's the real, right. the real gold, right? You know, comment out, out in the, the forefront and you'll find people. But, you know, that, that whole concept of background checks is a whole other thing because there's so many companies that do them. You don't know how reliable they are. Um, you know, I'll just say an interesting story I saw in my background, thankfully not directly for my company, is an organization was working with the Fed and put a bank robber in there. Nice. And the back, background check didn't catch that. So when the Fed did their Fed did their own internal background check in between, you know, ours, there was a, it was known we would do an upfront one, they would do another one. That was what was brought to the attention of, well, I kind of said it was our vendor, to our attention. And it was just, you know, that's a wild moment because you're like, well, we did everything right and they recognize we did everything right, but yet those skeletons can remain inside the closet. <laughs> yeah, we hired, uh, we hired a, uh, we had a 1099 contractor years back and we had them go through the background check for, through the law enforcement channel and they came back clean. Um, we're like, Hey, this guy's really working out for us. We offered him a job. He said, yes, I was setting up uh, payroll for direct deposit and ADP caught that his social security number wasn't valid. And upon further investigation, neither was he a citizen of the United States, nor did he have a legal work visa. Yeah. It's so. crazy. So with that said, it looks like uh, it looks like we're a little quiet on Q&As today, but you know, it looks like the majority of folks hung in there. So I really want to thank you all for that. 
to kind of close things off today again chris want to thank you for joining us you rachel bet. always a pleasure to have you with us as well i do want to say that uh you guys will all be getting an email with a link to this recording as well in the next day or so giving you the ability to go back to anything that you wanted to re-listen to as well and the, with that link to that will be a special offer for those of you that are not yet part of the msp community we'd love to have you come become part of it so uh with in you know in celebration of our release of uh, the sys controls there's going to be a special opportunity for you to save a, a fair amount of money uh, as we go forward if you decide to come on board so really want to thank everybody for joining us thank you again chris and rachel you and um you know we'll see you again next month with our next guest yes Thanks, thank guys. you chris you bet